moving ahead a little bit to the Carolingians, um, we see the same kind of issues and the same kind of fluidity uh, coming from the Carolingian period. Regular tours, so, I mean, the works that we're looking at later, like in our discussion group, are in fact Merovingian works. They come from the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. Um, and so the works that we're looking at are in fact Merovingian. But the same sort of ideas are also apparent in the Carolingian, which comes after the Merovingians. Um, they rhyme, so that should be helpful. The Carolingian comes after the Merovingians. Um, I don't have any way of remembering that, just simply, this is what it is. But, the histories, the scholarship in the Carolingian period follows largely the same kind of themes that we see in the Merovingian. People like Gregor Tours or the Libra story Drancor. So, for example, uh, in the Chronicles of Fridigar's Continuations, which is a collection of uh, work by supposed author uh, Fridigar, composed more or less simultaneously with a takeover of royal authority by Pippin III which represents the rise of the Carolingians. Basically, uh, Fridigar's continuation as chronicle coincides with the period in which the Merovingian dynasty is on the decline and replaced and usurped by Pepin III, who really sort of represents the beginning of the Carolingian dynasty. So basically, one family is now being replaced by another. And so Fridigar's continuations, his, his chronicle, his history, is very much meant to sort of, it coincides with this rise and so you can guess what he is going to be very interested in doing with his history. As central actors then, as, uh, in Fridigar's continuations, as central actors in this narrative, the carriage of princes and kings from Charles Martel onwards become the measuring rods for the political geography of Frankish rule. In other words, as both Kay and Ali point out, Fridigar is very keen on emphasizing the value and success of, of course, Carolingians now. Because they are the dominant power. They are the ones usurping. They're the ones that are now the dominant family. And so you want to show how they came. And again, they're, I mean, they're usurpers. Historically, they're a fairly recent family. They usurp the throne from the, you know, from the rightful king. Um, but it doesn't matter. You trace it back in order to justify why they should be on the throne. Uh, we see the same sort of thing in things like the Annals of Bets. Which uh, projected back all the way to Pepin II, who was a Frankish mayor of the palace who died in 714. So even though the Chronicles of Metz were written in 805, it goes all the way back, it goes back to this idea of theological reading of history, right? It goes all the way back to 714, the Frankish mayor of the palace, essentially, for lack of a better term, a prime minister, right? You have the king, you have a prime minister. Um, he's not actually a prime minister, but for simplicity's sake, the mayor of the palace is kind of like. Prime Minister, Defense Secretary, all these sorts of things. Um, and it comes to dominate, it actually comes to real power behind the throne. The king's on the throne, but in fact it is the, the, the mayor of the palace becomes a real power. The Frankish royal annals, so the royal Frankish annals of 790 uh, 829, again, do the same thing. So the point is, I know this isn't at this point most exciting, it gets more exciting later. But what I want to do is emphasize as to how comprehensive this project was. That's not just simply one historian, it's not simply one author, it's not just one book trying to you know, do this. This is a comprehensive project in which, and most of these are novice historians, we don't know who wrote these chronicles. In fact, most likely there are several authors, right? That the idea that um, most likely this, you know, different authors picked up at different times. But the fact is all of them are definitely trying to show why, in this case, the Carolingians now are the rightful rulers of the Frankish kingdoms. Even though they were usurpers, they took the throne, um, though not necessarily by war, fortunately, but through diplomacy. It is people like Charles Martel and the right argued, why should we remain mayors of the palace when the kings themselves are, well, they basically in the corner with safety scissors and glitter. Right? So that's that's kind of where the marriages are at this point. So why should we rule by kids with you know, safety scissors and glitter when I can put an axe through someone's head? Who was the real king? Tell me, of course. And so these chronicles then are all about emphasizing why the Carolingians were right to overthrow the Merovingians. 
And so the first of the Carolingians that is sort of seen with Charles Martel. And the reason why Charles Martel becomes important is because of one very um, instrumental event. And for those who take taking medieval history, does anyone know why Charles Martel is still, why is that so instrumental? I saw a lot of all my hands from medieval history. Why Charles Martel? All of the videos are crying inside now. Um, I feel like he got cooler his coronation was done by the Pope or something. Later, actually he's his ascendant. Okay. But his action, actually his event, leads to it. Charles Martel, which also means Charles the Hammer, Martel is Latin for a hammer, defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Poitiers. And so you see not only as a successful warrior, but a successful Christian warrior, right? This idea of a fight between Islam and Christianity. And so Charles Martel, who doesn't actually become king, it's his, you know, later, uh, his son later on becomes, and ends up becoming king. The point is, is that Charles Martel sets the Carolingians onto that road of why are we not the kings? Because obviously we're more successful. It's also interesting that about this time we start, using, start seeing the use of the term Frank to describe what we now, what we later call the French, right? Obviously, the word French comes from uh, comes from Frank. Um, but it's interesting is that about this point that we start seeing the term Frank as, in fact, a blanket term. Again, this idea that these later writers are going back in time and imposing an identity that most people may not have recognized. And one of the things uh, that I want to sort of talk about in the, in the tutorial a little later, and hopefully I'm not stealing from Miriam's thunder because she's presenting tonight, um, is about Gregory's book, which is often referred to as the History of the Franks. Uh, in fact, if you buy the Penguin edition, in fact, most versions, English versions of Gregory Tour's book is known as the History of, of the Franks, is in fact a misnomer. Gregory's book is actually should be referred to simply as the histories, because the Franks form only part of that history. Um, but it's a more snazzy title. Uh, editors, publishers like snazzy titles because it sells better. But the fact is, Gregory's book should in fact not be called History of the Franks. It's simply just the histories. And so, the so even the word Frank, in fact, is an invention. Um, and there's different way versions of where it comes from, and we'll look at some of those. Some uh, from Tro uh, as, again, as a Trojan origin, some from the Frankists. So why then do we see these Trojan origins? I mean, we've talked a lot about but the question is why? Is that what I take it? I mean, why do you think? Why do you think we, why, why tap into Troy? I mean, I think the Bible is one thing, I think that makes sense. If you are, you know, again, these are Christian peoples, the Bible I think makes sense from a Christian point of view, right? You want to tie yourself into that, into that sort of uh, environment. But why Troy? Yes? You were saying, I think, the great warriors, and that's like one of the oldest, like, most classic war stories, right? Okay. So I, no, no, you, you, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the Iliad, of course, which we get all, no, all we're saying about of the Trojan War, is in fact, you know, 5th century BC. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's an important, important epic. Right. right. Um, so yes, I think, I, think you, I think there's something there. Any other reason why, why Troy? Because there's some things that I don't have an answer to, but are interesting questions nonetheless that I want to pose a little bit later. Any other one? Why Troy? Yes. Maybe because they scatter after it'd be easy to kind of pick someone and say they came here. Okay, I think that is an excellent reason, right? With the fall of Troy, you have all these Trojans sort of running out, going everywhere. Again, for those who've read the Aeneid, right, that's supposedly where Augustus got his right to rule, that he was a descendant of Aeneid, who was a Trojan prince who fled the, Tro you know, fled the fall of Troy. So yes, you have this migration. The Trojans are part of migration narrative. Much of the way that Germans see themselves, or the Germanic tribes, were part of a different migration. So you have these two things sort of playing together. So I think that's a good reason. Any other reasons why you why they would pick Troy? You think? Ali? Correct me if I'm wrong, but what, weren't certain heroes of the Trojan War that were like descended from gods or like something like that? Okay, again, back. Like, like, no. Or was it like. Or favored at least. Apollo, or by Apollo, were they? Right. And again, it depends on which, you know, the fact is that there's. Again, you know, it's full of intervention of God. So either, if not descendants, certainly favored by. Right, so again, that's <coughs> So I think that, that's good. But the question I have, and it goes to the first point made, <coughs> Troy being, you know, these Trojans as great warriors, and yet who won the Trojan War? The Greeks, not the Trojans. In fact, the Trojans are losers. 
Right? The reason why they're scattering is because they lost. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so it gives them a reason to reclaim their homeland? <coughs> Um, interesting. No, I don't want to go to that area, right? Well, what's interesting is that they don't, right? The point is, they end up in France, they end up in England, they end up in you know, modern day. I guess you should say modern day France, <coughs> modern day England, modern day Italy. They don't. They don't go back to, to Asia Minor. They don't go back to modern day Turkey. But I, I think there's. But I think there's something to that idea. Any other reason why Troy? I think there's some really. I think you've put up some really good points. The fact is, in many ways, I think one. It really goes to the migration. I think the idea that it, the Greeks, yes, are victorious, but the Greeks are scattered with the victory of, you know, of anything, right? They, they aren't scattered because they went short. When the Trojans, you have this great scattering, this migration, and I think it ties into um, this migration narrative that we see. Let me go back to Friedrich's uh, continuations. Recorded the tradition that Priam was the first king of the Franks. And again, for those who have read the Iliad, will know that there's something very wrong with that statement. Priam, king of the Franks. For those who read the Iliad, Priam was king of Troy. Right? He was a Trojan through and through. The Iliad, there's absolutely no indication of Franks in the Iliad. If there are, I'd like to see it, because that would be changed, you know, that would change the course of classic forms all over, all over the world. The fact is, in the Iliad, which is really only, you know, at least for medieval Europeans, only reference they would have had, Priam, Priam, of course, is only the key of Troy. However, people like Fritigar are already now changing that narrative and arguing that Priam is, in fact, um, the first king of the Franks. It was succeeded then by his son Friga, Friga the people, the children that split up, going back to the idea of the scattered migration narrative. Some remain in Macedonia, again, founding other peoples, um, and some fall into the Danube and back to the ocean. So again, this idea that Europe, not just France, not just England, not, not just Western Europe, but all of Europe, is in fact descended from Trojans. You know, I guess you can, I mean, it, on one hand, yes, they lost, but on the other hand, they won, right? Then there's a further division. So these people keep split up this migration. Um, some stay around the Macedonian state in that area and are ruled by Torkov, who becomes the founder of the Turks. While others follow Fratio to the Rhine, where they came known as Franks. And hence the idea that the, art, that the um, story is that Fratio is a Trojan Prince, Trojan warrior, flees, escapes Troy, the destruction of Troy, and of course gives his name to the people known now as Franks. Again, it's that way of making of etymology, right? That, well, if his name is Franks, if we're called Franks, well, that means our founder must have had a name that sounded like Franks. Francio, there we go. Francio, the Franks, we're all part of one big genealogy. However, and I, this is what I find very interesting about this is the fact that there are different different versions of this narrative. And so for Fridigar, it is a straightforward narrative that Priam was king, was the first king of France, and at the fall of Troy, basically splits up into two major groups, one sort of staying in the Macedonian area, becoming the founder of the Turks, and the other group moving to the Rhine area, to Western Europe, and becoming known as the Franks. In the leading story of Francorum, which is one of the things that we uh, have read for tonight, it provides another version of the Trojan origin story. Uh, written down around the year 727, according to the Libra story of Francorum, after the fall of Troy, Priam and Antinor led 1,200 men down the Rutanus and then to the Sea of Asphalt. So again, it's migration scattered. So it says this you know, similar narrative. From there, they moved to Pannonia, which is in Germany, or modern-day Germany, and they found a city called Secambria. And one of the things that's what I find, as a historian myself, having looked at 16th century culture, 16th century histories, is even though by the 16th century, the idea of Secambria is regarded as mythical, you know, no one really believes it, the idea of Secambria still remains pretty much, um, there's still 
an historical value to it. Uh, much the way that King Arthur is to the English, right? Um, the legend of Arthur, right? The, the, the future king, the once a future king. Why is he the future king? The once a future king, that in England's greatest need, Arthur would return. No one believes it. But it's a very interesting thing. In fact, what's interesting is that in World War II, there were people that were looking to an Arthur. No one believed that there was, you know, that King Arthur would ride on, you know, from catalog with a nice restaurant table. But some of the rhetoric that comes out of World War II draws upon. In fact, for those who haven't here read Sword of the Stone, right, or seen the movie, Disney version of it, which don't, but the book, in this case, the book really is much better. The Sword of the Stone was written around World War II deliberately because of the idea of a once and future king. It was meant, not, not I don't know necessarily to rally the troops, or, or but it draws upon the idea that World War II represented for England, and you know, for, also for so many people, the work, like how can things be worse? If Arthur's going to come back, now is the time. And so, just as in England, or with the certain circles with English thought, there is this idea of a King Arthur coming back in England's most dire need. So Cabrera remains that idea. And so the Ark, so according to the Libra story of Ancorum, the Franks under Priam build a city. Um, while there, they meet with uh, Roman Emperor Valentinian, I believe just make sure I got it right. The emperor, yes, Valentinian, who basically are, makes a, a deal. He's got problems with other tribes. He says, "Anyone who can help help me rid myself of my political enemies, I will give them a ten-year uh, exemption from any taxes and tribute that I would normally charge." And so, these new Franks said, "We'll do that." And so they feed the Franks victorious, and so they get a ten-year reprieve from all forms of taxation and tribute. At the end of ten years, the emperor, according to the deal, based on the, on the contract, goes back and says, okay, now ten years are over, time to start paying your taxes. How do you think that the Franks took that idea? Yeah, they're not. Bad. Yes, so very, very badly. In fact, uh, the Franks kill the tax collectors that come to collect the taxes, and Valentinian goes to um, do, to defeat them. Basically, a huge battle, and the Franks leave their cities in Cambria, and then start spreading again throughout Western Europe. Back to the idea of a spreading and migratory um, migration narrative. After moving, after leaving us in Cambria. Um, Priam's son, uh, Martian Mary, they don't need to worry about these names necessarily, but the one name you do need to know is that according to this legend, Pharamond, and some of these press see it's spelled with an F, some has PH, but Pharamond is elected as a Rex Crinitus. In other words, a long haired king. And this becomes incredibly significant for the Franks, at least for the Merovingians. Because one of the things the Merovingians are known as, they're known as the long haired kings, and the long hair is a sign of their right to rule. And that one of the things, if you want to um, convince or, or defeat a Merovingian, at least a king, cut his hair. And this happens a lot. Uh, defeated kings, if they're not killed, are often short, their heads are shaved, and they're sent to monasteries. Because the idea of the hair, as long hair, is sort of seen as a symbol, or part of the symbol of their power. Uh, and according to legend, Pharamond was the first of these long-haired kings. Um, completely mythical, although, if, again, sort of Fairmont in some ways is seen as the first real French king. That this is sort of founder of the Merovingian dynasty. Um, again, whether or not there was a real Fairmont is to be able to post, there, probably, there may have been, and I'm willing to accept the fact that there probably was a real historical Fairmont, but not the legendary Fairmont of Trojan origins. Certainly not. As we mentioned, the fact is, um, we have this migration narratives. After Pharamond, we have the birth of Merovish. Now, this, this is fantastic. This is in part what this, uh, sort of set me on this course to start with this course. Because according to some legends, Merovish is just simply a, you know, a son or a descendant of Pharamond. But according to other legends, Merovish is a descendant from a sea monster. Uh, apparently, according to legend, 
According to Friedegar, actually Friedegar is the one that has this story. According to Friedegar, one day, uh, Meredith's mother was swimming in a lake, or in a river, but I mean, she was swimming, and where she is accosted by a quinitar, or a sea monster. And the result, of course, is Meredith. Um, always puts in mind of uh, that scene. That, this is my one, my one and only Monty Python reference in this class. It reminds me of scene in Search for Holy Grail, in which um, Dennis the peasant, after being repressed, says, "You know, aquatic tarts throwing swords around is no way, no system of government." In a way, this is what I think of. Um, Women have, you know, I mean, I don't care what people do in their privacy of their own lakes. Um, you know, who, who am I to judge? Who are we to judge what people get up to in the privacy of their own lakes? But the fact is, um, according to according to Fridigar, Mary Rich's mother had a had some fun times with a Quinitar in which Maravish is descended from a sea monster, therefore giving him a supernatural origin. So not only is he Trojan, but what he's also supernatural. Perhaps a credit card she could use a Trojan. Bravery, of course, we're getting most of our information from, uh, ignores the entire story. In fact, for Gregory, he most likely saw it as a pagan myth that to be completely ignored, completely buried under, under concrete, basically. But despite sort of our huh moment on that, really, a sea god or sea monster, the original legend of the Merovingians, as recorded by Fridigar, is important not only for a suggestion that the family claimed to be descended from a supernatural ancestor, and again, that's a really important thing, particularly in a warrior society. Why, why are we on top? Well, because we have, well, a supernatural origin, right? That I'm descended from a sea god, I'm descended from a sea monster. That gives me something more than what you've got. And so that's an important thing. But it also has implications for the rise of the dynasty. Another historian, uh, Sidonius of Apollinaris, records the defeat of Merovingian's father in 448, suggests that the Merovingians began the rise in the last half of the 5th century. So, what we really have here are two conflicting ideas. And one, I think, we'll see why, and why we have these really weird stories. The most, the most realistic story, the most realism here, is about the Merovingians don't appear until the mid-late 5th century. Again, simply as a dominant family. That if there was a real Merovish, again, if, this, if these people were real, that Merovish may have been simply a powerful warlord. Again, just a strong man among other strong men who happened to be more successful. But again, but the point being, that's not exciting, and that doesn't really justify anything. You add simply sprinkle of supernatural and a dash of Trojan, and before you know it, you're not just a parvenu, you're not simply a newcomer, you've got You've got a history, right? Although the reality is that most likely the Merovingians were nothing more than a startup family that were more successful than their neighbors. And so we take then the actual early references of the French, we look at the actual archaeology, we look at the actual history, ignore the myths, ignore the legends, as exciting as far as they are, what we realize what we're dealing with is a confederacy of people long settled in the region of the Lower Rhine. In the third and fourth century, these people were responsible for uh, river and maritime raids against northeastern provinces of Gaul and Germany. In other words, the Franks, all these you know, supposedly you know, supernatural, wonderful people, are in fact nothing more than pirates. It's pretty much what they were. Kind of like the Vikings in the eighth and ninth centuries, right? In the end, you know, what sort of legends about you know, descent from Woden and all that, the fact is, pirates. Successful pirates, to be sure, but nothing really much more than that. And yet, at the same time, of course, there are elements within the Confederacy which became increasingly associated with the Roman Empire. So you have, again, within this group, those who engage in piracy, and others that realize, you know what, perhaps tying our wagon to the Romans is a good idea. Yes, the Empire has sort of passed its best before date by this point, but the fact still is, 
Rome still has that cachet, it has that prestige. And so you have then many of, so some of these families tie themselves to Roman ideas. And in many ways, we see this with Clovis, who is a person that we know really did exist as a Merovingian, who acts more as a Roman kinglet than a Germanic warrior. Right? He dresses like a Roman. He uh, converts to what we later become known as Roman Catholicism. He drills his troops like Romans. He establishes, you know, maintains Roman governorships, maintains Roman structures. And so the rise of these people often coincide with much more prosaic and, in a sense, more boring ways of doing things. But it's important for us to remember this because, again, I think these, these issues have echoes to us, right? That we do the exact same thing. Now, I engage in, as Canadians, we're not engaged in piracy, as I hope we're not, but we're not engaged in piracy. But the point is, we still tell ourselves stories about who we are and where we come from. Scandinavia is another example of where we see the same type of process. And the reason why, the other reason I chose Scandinavia is to show that even that this process sometimes it seems independent. Right? That, you know, sometimes these, we have these common ideas. And so one of the examples is the Orkney Saga, the history of the Earls of Orkney. Now, Scandinavians produce all kinds of sagas. In fact, I highly recommend reading sagas, I think some are, some are just absolutely fantastic pieces of, of literature. Uh, but the one I'm looking at, the one I want to use tonight is the history of the Earls of Orkney. Written around 1200, so it's much later. This is a much later piece of writing. Uh, the works that we're looking at are 6th century, 5, no, 500, 600, 700 AD. This one is 1200. This is quite late for our period. Um, but it does, again, the exact same thing. It tries to explain the origins. Where did these Earls of Orkney come from? And we all know where Orkney are. The Orkney Islands are. Anyone not sure as to where the Orkneys are? The Orkneys are the northern islands of Scotland. So if you go to Scotland, uh, the Orkneys are part of that island. So you have the Shetland Islands and the Orkney Islands. They're in that sort of northern Scotland area. Um, so connected, so again, very connected to, uh, very close to Norway, uh, Sweden, so it makes sense that we um, during the Viking and, and Norwegian and Scandinavian migrations, uh, the islands are inhabited by Scandinavians. So the stories they told. And like everything else, like what we see in the French records, what we see in the English records, these stories share certain features with other Icelandic heroes, such as Nolf Saga, Grichur Saga, Eagle Saga, and that, of course, is a founding father, um, sometimes mythological origin, um, again, to explain where these peoples come from. You want to give yourself some sense of, of, of a history. But what I think important is the date itself, 1200. As I said, it's very late for our period. And I think that's significant because it's late. We can really see that process, right? Whereas with Fridigar's Chronicles in the 700s, or with Gregory Tours in the 5th century, it says they're closer to these origins, right? They're, they're closer. Whereas 1200, you're looking back at hundreds of years, maybe 300 years of history being written later, 300 years later at least. There's a lot of opportunity now to recreate, reinvent your origins. And so we have that a mythic, uh, mythic past in the Orkney Saga. And it begins, and go back to that quote from the first, so the first stanza, the first part of the, of the saga. There was a king called Fornyot who ruled over Finland, uh, Finland uh, the country stretching to the east of what we call the Gulf of Bothnia, which lies opposite of the White Sea. He had three sons, Hler, Aj, or also known as Ajir, Sagbal Logi, the third Kerry, the father, so on and so forth. Right? There is a mythical origin. And I pointed out, those names are significant. In the sense that Logi means flame, Kari is storm, Frosty is, well, frost, Snar is snow, and Hilar or Azure, depending on what version of the name you want to use, are associated with, the, with an ancient Scandinavian sea god back to this idea of a sea monster, sea god of some sort that is the family that somehow is connected 
that these people are descended from, again, supernatural origins. And in part, for the Orkney saga, it's important because by the 1200s, there is, there is a conflict or a debate as to really who owns the Orkney Islands. Is it the Scandinavians or is it the, new, or is it the Scottish? Because right? after all, the Orkneys are, you know, are part, you know, are seen as part of Scotland. And so part of the, the purpose behind the Orkney saga is to say, to lay claim to geography. Not just to um, emphasize the right of rule of, of one family or one person, but in this case, to own land. That the land is theirs because we've been here since we were you know, descended from a saying, the name is Sea God. Can you claim that? And if you can't, then, you know, don't matter. 